So we talked about um, the standard form. We defined a standard form for linear programming problems. And then we claimed that all the problems that we have seen with linear constraint, with inequality and all that, can be all converted into the standard form by some tricks, right? So we introduced last time one um, kind of a trick or technique to deal with constraints that has inequality sign. Okay, so let's um, summarize with that and then we'll move on. So, summary. So this is about converting everything into the standard form. So we see that for the constraints, we rem remember for inequality constraints, let's say with the um, less than equal sign, what did we do? We introduced a new slack variable, is that right? Let's call it xk. And what do we do with xk? We add this on the left hand side, is that right? Do you remember? So add positive xk, okay, on the left hand side of the inequality, and then I will have to change the inequality sign into equal sign. And I need to require xk shall be bigger than 0. Is that right? So you can think this is a summary. You can think this is the algorithm eventually you'll be using to, to do this conversion. All right? OK. And then the second, it's a symmetric part where my inequality has the other sign bigger than equal to 0. So what we will do, well, we also introduce a slack variable, and we add the negative of it onto the equation on the left-hand side. Is that right? Left-hand side. And then I change into change the bigger than that into equal. And then I also need a non-negativity. All my variables in linear programming in the standard form, they are non-negative. So is that part OK? Mm -hmm. So these are called slack variables. So just give the name again, slack variables. OK, so there is one more situation we will have to learn to handle. That is, so OK, so so far in all the um, examples we have seen, all the variables we define, they are naturally non-negative. So that's why that constraint comes. It could also happen for some model, I have a variable for me to control, but actually there's no constraint on it. Okay? And I wish to write this in the standard form. So here's the question. What do we do? So what if um, one variable is unrestricted? Okay, let's say, say, um, say, there is a variable x. Um, let's call it x i. There's no restriction on it; it has to be positive or whatever. Okay, so how do you deal with it? What trick can you play? So, any comments? Any ideas? Think about what we want to do. We want to replace this unrestricted variable with something that's always non-negative, right? How can we do that? If I replace it with just one variable, there is no way that variable can be non-negative. Is that right? How about I use two extra variables to help me? 
Can I do that? Let's say I introduce two new variables, and they both are non-negative, and the difference between them is my xi. And the difference can be positive or negative, depending on the, the size of the new variables I introduce. Is that an OK idea? All right, so let's do that. It's a kind of a, a rather a dirty trick, OK? But it, the trick, it's a trick that works. OK, so here's the answer. What do we do? Introduce. Now I need two new variables. OK? Um, say um, xi prime, xi double prime. So I need two to handle one. OK? They are both um, non-negative. So xi prime is bigger than 0. xi double prime is bigger than equal to 0. And then we would let xi to be the difference between these two. Then I have all the variables that's non-negative in my problem. And it's, it would take the standard form. Do we see? So this way of doing is kind of a artificial. Do you agree? That's why the name. So these are called artificial variables. OK? So while the first one is they are called slack variables, they have meanings. And these ones, they don't really have any physical meaning if you go back to your model. It's just something artificial. So we can write it in the standard form. And we will develop methods to solve problems in the standard form. OK? Is it clear what to do? Let's take an example, and we will have to combine all these little tricks that we have learned. OK? So take an example. All right. Let's say I want you to convert the first, the next problem into standard form. Convert to standard form. Okay. So I want to maximize this quantity. These are just just numbers I put up. Okay. I want to maximize that. And I have a um, bunch of constraints subject to the following. So I have the following. So 4 x1 minus x2 plus x4 less than 6, negative 7, x1, 8, x2, just numbers, x3, let's say, bigger than 7. And then x1 plus x2 plus 4x4 four four equals to 12. And I have x1, x2, x3 is non-negative. But I have the variable x4 is unrestricted. It can take any sign. OK? So we wish to convert this into a into the standard form. So what shall we do? Okay. So standard form we will be minimizing something. Here it's maximizing. So I have to first deal with that. What do I have to do if I change into minimizing? This function here now is being maximized. If I want to minimize something that will be the same as maximizing this, what should I minimize? Remember the trick we talked about first trick? We just multiply negative sign in front of that function. Is that right? OK, so that we can handle. All right, now let's look at the constraints. We have a bunch of constraints. This one is OK. It's an equal sign. This is less than. This is bigger than. We have to deal with that by introducing slack variables. 
and scanning through, I see that, oh, I have an unrestricted variable I have to deal with. Okay, and let's see what we can do to deal with all, all each of these. So for this one, we have to introduce a slack variable, right? So let's say um, I call this slack variable x5. So it's less than equal sign, so I'll be adding x5 to the left-hand side. Is that right? So I just say add that, you know what I mean, and then I will want x5 to be bigger than equal to 0. That's how I deal with it. Okay. And then for the second inequality, it's bigger than equal sign, then the slack variable shall be actually subtracted on the left-hand side. Okay. But we always say add, so I will add negative, let's call x6 is the slack that I add here. Okay. So x6 bigger than equal to 0. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. And this one, well, I don't need to change it. It's fine. It's already an equal sign. It's in the standard form. Okay. Okay, so that's okay. That's fine. This part is okay. We, we need them to be non-negative. Okay, so then the last one. X4 is unrestricted. So we need to play this dirty trick that we just learned. We need to introduce artificial variables. So I will have to set x4 equals to two artificial variables, let's say x4 prime and x4 double prime, where they are both non-negative. So is that clear? So you scan through all of it and figure out all the changes you have to make. Okay? And now you can write it down in the standard form. Any questions? Yeah? Can you write a little bigger? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'll try. Yeah. You know, um, it's, it's all recorded, okay. and he zooms in on the blackboard. If you miss anything I wrote, it's unclear. You can watch it, that part. And, but I'll try to write bigger. I'm just telling the alternatives. We have the technology. <laughs> All right? I'll write bigger. I know. Because today, I need a lot of blackboard space. I'm trying to be savvy. OK. All right, so standard form. Is that good? Mm -hmm. OK, so. Maximizing will have to be changed into minimize. Is that right? So we know this has to be multiplied by a negative 1. So I've been minimizing negative 3x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 minus x4 plus 87. OK, so that's the first lesson. First thing to do, so subject to, now we have to deal with the, the constraints. So you know you have to add x5 to the left-hand side, change it into equal. But in this first equation, I also have an x4. I know I have to replace it with two artificial variables. Is that right? You have to put all these in. Okay. So now the first constraint becomes actually the following, 4x1 minus x2 plus, now the x4 will have to be changed into x4 prime, x4 double prime. Is that clear? And then I need to add a slack variable, x5, and this equals to 6, and change that into equal sign. OK? Mm -hmm. Second equation. Looking at it, there are no x, there's no x4 on the left-hand side, so all we need to do is add the slack variable. Okay, so I'll copy down negative 7x1, 8x2, x3. I need to subtract a new slack variable, x6, equals to 7. Okay? Okay, and the next one is unchanged. I keep this equation, but I spot x4 in it. I need to change that into the artificial variables that I introduced. Okay, So I have x1, x2, plus 
4 times that, so 4, x4 prime minus 4, x4 double prime, that equals to 12. Okay? All right, and then I have to collect all my variables now, x1, x2, x3. Now I don't have x4, it's replaced by x4 prime, x4 double prime, and then I have x5, x6, they all shall be non-negative. So the, that will be all my constraints. Is that clear? Question? Yeah? Oh, yes, I should, I forgot, because x4 is not there anymore. Good question, very, very good. I need to replace that as well. Now it has a plus. Is that right? Now we are correct. 87. Thank you. Is it correct now? Any more comments? We okay? Right. Okay. Now I'll give you some more terminology. We have to name things, give them terms that's important. Okay. Okay, so now we have the standard form. Uh -huh. It consists of two parts. One is something for you to optimize and then the constraints. So we can we're going to call the function here that you try to optimize it has a name. It's called the objective function. Okay, so that's the function to optimize. In the standard form is to minimize. And then I have a second term, so this is the definition, the terms. The second term is, uh, so we talked about um, feasible region earlier. Now we're defining this term called feasible solutions. Okay. Because you see in the standard form, all the constraints are equal. Is that right? So if you find a set of variables that all these equations holds plus the positivity constraint, you can say that it's kind of a solution that solved all these equations. And these are called feasible solutions. Okay? Right? So it's a set of x1 all the way to xn in the standard form, non negative. And uh, satisfies all constraints. Okay, so with these terms put up, now we can state our problem with these fancy words. <laughs> so what will be our problem now? So we want to optimize the objective function over the set of all feasible solutions, right? Sounds fancy, right? Okay, so optimize the objective function over the set of feasible solutions. Okay. Okay. So from now on, we'll be dealing with uh, how to solve problems in the standard form. Okay. If you have a problem that's not in the standard form, you first write it into the standard form, and then we solve it from there. Okay. And you realize that in the standard form, so all the constraints are actually written as equal to. 
And each of these are linear equations. So you end up solving a bunch of linear equations simultaneously. Is that right? Does it recall some course we have learned that deal with this? You have to solve linear equations simultaneously. Mm. Matrices, of course, cost 220. Is that right? And that's why it's in the prereq. I need you to, um, to be able to do that, OK? But how about we do a lead, uh, kind of a very light review just to um, remind ourselves so we'll be all on the same pace. Mm -hmm. So review of linear equations. So we want to solve that. Okay. So in particular, I will be talking about a procedure called the pivoting. Okay. We'll be focusing on this procedure. So I know um, you have learned methods of solving these equations. And we are interested in particular in that one. OK, so let's take an example how to see how this is in action. So let's say I want to solve the following, just, just some equation that cook up, it's nothing fancy. So let me put this up. Oh. Is the size of my font shrinking? I have a default size <laughs> that I can watch to. OK, I'll remind myself, right big, 2 x1 plus 2 x2 3 x3 equals to 7 x1 plus x2 plus 4 x3 equals to OK, let's start with this simple example where I have three unknowns and three linear equations. And I want to find the solution. We all know how to do it, is that right? We have different ways of dealing with it. You can do elimination, substitution, or Gaussian elimination and backward substitution, any method you have. Okay. So what I want to talk about now is one method. We call it the pivoting, okay, which will be useful later on for linear program programs. Okay. I will label my equation 1 and 2 and 3, okay? and then I'll keep changing them in every step. So here's the pivoting process. Let's say take step 1. Okay. I pick a variable, and I pick an equation and I pivot that variable in that equation. So let's say, just make a choice. Let's say, OK, this looks nice. I want to pivot x1 in equation 1. OK, so choose. This is your choice. We choose to pivot x1 in equation 1. So what does it mean? What do we wish to achieve? We wish to achieve the following. We want x1 to have coefficient, coefficient 1 in equation 1. And we want to eliminate x1 in all the other equations. Is that clear? So the goal is, you have two goals. So we need to do the following. x1 should have, should has coefficient 1 in equation 1. That's first goal. And then also, we have to eliminate x1 in the other two equations, in equation 2 and 3. Is that familiar? We have done this in 220, similar stuff. So what do you do? OK, so first, x1 has to, has coefic has to have coefficient 1. OK, it is already with coefficient 1, so that's OK. If not, I'll just multiply this equation by the reciprocal and make it 1. Is that right? OK, now I need to eliminate this in the second equation and in the third equation. How do I do that? Well, I could multiply equation 1 with negative 2 and add on top of equation 2. Is that right? And then this guy is gone. 
And then I can multiply equation 1 with negative 1, add on top of equation 3, and this will be eliminated. Is that clear? We have all done that, right? So, okay, so I'm going to just do that. So what we will do is equation 2 now will be, let's put a prime on it, equation 2 will be set to be um, equation 1 multiplied by um, negative 2, add on top of equation 2, okay? And equation 1 is unchanged. Okay, so equation 1, 1 prime simply equals to equation 1. I don't change it. And then equation 3 prime, the new one, will be set to be equation 1 times negative 1 and add on top of equation 3. Is that okay? We're familiar with that? Okay, so may I write out what I have in the end? Okay, so let me write out these three numbers, uh, three equations. So I have x1 plus 2, x2 plus x3 equals two, 4. And these two x1s are gone. I have negative 2, x2 plus x3 equals to negative 1, and negative x2 plus 3x3 3 equals 2. Okay, so I, I label them again. This is equation 1 prime, and uh, equation 2 prime after, 2, 1 prime, sorry, and 3 prime after um, step 1. I get a new system. Are we okay? So we finished the pivoting for x1. Okay, now we need to choose between x2 and x3. Okay, so let's say I make my choice. I choose to do, um, I will pivot x2 in equation 2. Is that okay? So pivot x2 in equation 2. Okay, so how do you do that? Then I get a new system. So I see first that um, I need to make this coefficient 1 here, and then I need to eliminate these two x2s in the equation 1 and 3. So, so equation 2 double prime will be replaced by equation 2 prime multiplied by a suitable constant, the reciprocal of that, negative 2, 1 over negative 2, is that right? Okay? And then equation 1, double prime, after this step, shall be replaced by, well, I can add 2 on top of 1, and then this will be 0. Okay? So 2 prime plus 1 prime. Okay? And equation 3, the new one, will be the following equation. Uh -huh. So I need to multiply this by negative half and put on top of this one, right? Okay, so you see these are better done by computers once you have an algorithm. So I take equation 2, multiply by um, negative half, and then I add it on top of equation 3. Is that okay? You see this can be carried out. And if I do that, and then I'll have the following. These will be x1, x2 is gone, f2, x3, what I have is 3, and then I have x2, negative half, x3 equals to half, and I have 5 over 2, x3 equals to 5 over 2. So that's my new system. Let's say this is 1 double, 2 double, and 3 double prime. Okay. So we finished the pivoting for x1 and x2. The only one left is x3. Is that right? Now at this point, you don't have a choice. You have to pivot x3 in equation 3. Is that right? So that's the final step. Step 3, pivot x3 in equation 3. Okay, now 3 is 3 double primes, just 
a new equation number three. OK, so that's you multiply this by 2 over 5. And then you have x3 equals to 1, and you basically remove x3 in the first two equations. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So if you do that, you get the following. x1 equals 2, x2 equals 2, and x3 equals 2. So the left-hand side is now diagonal. Mm -hmm. may, may we use that term? And you find out that's the solution. <coughs> Is that OK? Are we familiar with this pivoting process? We've done it before? OK. Very good. OK. Yeah, question? Yeah, so would there be problems where it's like specifically used pivoting, or would, is this just like a suggestion of way to do it? That's what we'll be using. Okay. That's why I go through it. Yeah. So this is something you're familiar with. So we review it, and we build on top of it, and we go very high. Question? Matrix form will come, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it will be much easier to write AX equal to B, right? <laughs> Instead of all these, yeah, but OK. Yeah, OK. Let's make um, two observations, so kind of important. What, what are we doing here? What's essential? And what, how can it be used further? So first observation. We see that. OK, so this is a problem, the number of unknown equals to the number of equations. So you know if it's well defined, you find a unique solution, right? And by this pivoting process. And as we are going through it, we notice that the order we do the pivoting is my choice. I chose to do x1 in equation 1 and then x2 to in equation 2. I could have done it in other order. I would have reached the same answer. Is that right? So order of pivoting, I want to say, is a choice. OK? Maybe not so obvious in this problem. So now let's go to the second observation. If now I have a different type of problem, that is, I have more unknowns than my equations. And I want to solve something like that, which will be very common in the constraint of the LP problems. Okay? And I notice that I can carry out a similar pivoting process. And I have freedoms to choose which variable will be the ones I want to pivot with. Is that right? So similar, not exactly the same. Similar procedures procedure can be used for, let's say, um, what is the M? M? I want to say M is the number of equations and is the number of unknowns. OK? And uh, N is bigger than M. So I have more unknowns than my equations. And you should know that solutions will not be unique. There will be many, many. There'll be a whole set of solutions, right? OK. Now we're going to take an example. And this example will be used over and over and over again. So let me start on the left and put this example here. So this will be in connection eventually going into linear programming. But right now, let's just look at these two, this system here. I want to solve a system of two equations as follows, x1, x2, 2, x3, x4 equals 6. And 3x2 plus x3 plus 8x4 is 3. OK, so that's my system. I call it star. And so in this example, so I relabel 
I use equation one and two again in this example. All right? Okay, first I want to show that we can carry out a um, pivoting process um, um, by our choice of how to do it and reach some form of solution for this. Is that okay? Okay, so let's try to solve this. So answer, and we'll see some new um, situations popping up here. Okay, we want to go through pivoting, so I will see that um, very conveniently, I think I, I would like to choose to pivot x1 in equation 1. Can I do that? Why? Because I see that this is already 0, so it's done, actually, for me, right? It's ready, all right? So step 1, I choose, so choose, that's my choice, choose to pivot x1 in equation 1. Okay, and then I see it's already done. There's nothing I need to do. Okay. Now the second one is also my choice. Let's see, now I can choose, um, let's say I make a choice. I want to choose to pivot x2 in equation 2. Is that okay? Just, okay, we'll do other variables later on. Let's say, let's deal with that. Choose to pivot x2 in 2. Okay, so what does it mean? This means I need to make the coefficient here to be 1, and I, to, and I to need to eliminate the, eliminate the x2 in the first equation. Is that right? Is it clear? So how can I do it? Okay, so um, I will, the second equation now will be replaced by multiply the second equation by one-third. Is that right? And the first equation will be replaced by take the second equation, multiply it with negative one-third, then I'll get negative x2 and I add on top the first equation. Is that clear? Okay? So I will have the following, which is very important for us. So I have x1, x2 is gone, 0, x2, so I leave an open space. I would like to line up my variables, right? So that's for x3, and that's for x4, and that equals to 5. And then the second equation is x2 plus 1 third x3 plus 8 over 3 x4 equals to 1. Okay? So this is equation 1 prime, and this is 2 prime. That's my new system. So you see, it's in a very special form. That is, the two variables that I chose to pivot, they are 1 in one equation and not present in any other equation. Is that right? And x2 has coefficient 1 here, but it's not present in all the other equations. Okay? So now I want to define a terminology. Let's say I will not write it down rigorously. Let's just refer to this form. So it's a form of this equation that's written in this form that the variables I choose to pivot is 1 in one equation and 0 vanishing all the other. Okay, this form has a term, let's give the name, terminology, here. So this one here is called a canonical form. Okay. It's a canonical form, and then of course, with respect to what variable you choose to pivot, right? So these variables have name also, they are called basic variables, x1, x2. So is this definition clear? I'm defining two things here. One is a canonical form, and the other is basic variables. Okay, Those are the ones that you pivoted. And all the others are called 
non-basic variables. Okay, so x3 here, x4, they are called non-basic variables. All right. Okay, so how can we interpret the solution now if you have it in canonical form? So you see, one way of expressing the solution for this would be I keep the basic variables on the left-hand side and move everything else to the right-hand side. So I express basic variables in terms of the non-basic ones, and the non-basic ones will be arbitrary. Is that right? So let me write out, OK? So solution can be expressed as I can write it as the following. I can write x1 equals to move everything to the right, 5 minus 5 over 3, x3 minus 5 over 3, x4, x2 is 1 minus moving everything to the right, the num non-basic variables to the right, OK? And then where x3, x4, they are arbitrary. They can be anything. You can put any numbers for x1 and x3 and x4, and you can compute the x1 and x2, and that gives you a solution. So there are infinitely many of solutions, right? It's a whole set. Okay. So among all these solutions, there is one that is of particular interest. Let me single that out. I have one particular solution. Okay. Which is probably the easiest one to write out. I could set all the non-basic variables to be 0, since they're arbitrary, I can just set them to be 0. And the basic ones will take the value on the right-hand side. Do we see that? And that is one solution, right? That one has meaning. It's important. So let's say here I can set x3 equals to 0, x4 equals to 0, and then I will get x1 will be 5 and x2 will be 1. That's one solution. Okay, So this one, we would uh, write it in um, just uh, a tuplet of four numbers, x1, x2, x3, x4. This will give me 5, 1, 0, 0. Is that clear what I mean by that? OK, it's a kind of a, in a vector form. OK, but right now it's just tuplet. Okay. okay. Is everything clear so far? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so far, what we did was we introduced this canonical form and introduced the concept of basic variables, and we single out one particular solution. Now, if this shall be part of a linear program problem, and these are the equations in the constraint, then we would have additional constraints of non-negativities of all the variables. Is that right? All the x shall be non-negative. Okay, let's point this out. This is actually a big deal. So if the system star is part of linear programming constraint, then we we also need the non-negativity. So x1, x2, x3, x4 has to be non-negative. We must require that. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so just, just these are all observations. Okay, so now let's go back to, to build up more connections. So we see if I manage to write um, my equation part of my constraint into the canonical form, then as we observe that, I can always write out one particular solution as I did here. That is, I can set the non-basic variables to be zero, and the basic variables will just take the right-hand side value of the, the canonical form. Is that clear? And that one is a special solution that I would like to give a name. So let me, let me don't write too low. You can't see if I go down here. Okay. So in the canonical form, one particular solution is the following. So you can set all non-basic variables, set them to be zero, okay? And then the basic variables will simply equal to the corresponding right-hand side value in the canonical form. Okay. So this is a solution you can immediately write down once you have that form. Okay. And that is actually a very important, um, so I give you another terminology, a very important solution. Okay. So this particular solution, the one here, this is called a basic solution. Okay, so that's the term that we are defining. So just by doing that, I have a solution that is a basic solution. And then in connection with linear programming, the feasible solutions would be non-negative, so if now my basic solution shall be non-negative, then it's also feasible. Is that right? Okay. Then we give it a, a different name. Okay, so if this solution is also non-negative, we call it, what would you call it? A basic solution that is feasible. Mm -hmm. How about a basic feasible solution or a feasible basic solution? Would that be okay? <laughs> All right, so let's say A is the same thing, basic. It has to be basic and it has to be feasible, both of them, right? You have to put two adjectives in the front. Solution. Okay, so that's another term. All right. So we have basic solution and basic feasible solution. Okay. So I want to put up some remarks now. That's kind of important. So and we'll take examples. So remark. We see that by choosing um, the basic variable in the process of pivoting, we will reach a basic solution. But then if I choose a different one, I will reach a different basic solution. Is that right? There are many of them. Then it's not unique, right? So first remark, there are many basic solutions, OK? depending on how you choose the basic variables, they'll be different. And then the second one is bad news. Now, not all basic solutions are feasible. The example we had, this happened to be feasible. It's all non-negative, but that's not the general case. So not all basic 
solutions are feasible. Okay, so we'll take an example for each of these cases and try to understand what's happening. All right, so take an example for the first case here. So I'm saying there are many other basic solutions, and let's try to get one. So in my procedure, after I have chosen equation uh, x1 in equation 1, Instead of choosing x2 in equation 2 to pivot, I could choose some other variables, right? Let's say I pick x4 to pivot in equation 2. I can do that. I just want to show you some other basic solutions. Okay? So if now we choose x1 in equation 1, and after that, x2. In equation, no, x4, sorry, in equation 2, in our pivoting process, what will we have? So, are we comfortable with this pivoting process? Can I just write down what you will get if you do that? Mm -hmm. So we get the following x1 plus 5, 8 x2 plus 15, 8 equals to 45 over 8. And this not so pretty number, just ugly fractions, but it's OK. OK, that's what you will have. Now, you see this is being pivoted, and also that. Those are your basic variables. OK? OK, let's say double star. That's the second. Um, it's equivalent to the star, but it looks different. OK, so let's find a basic solution. The basic solution with these choices of basic variables. Basic solution. So. You will set all the non basic variables to be zero, right? So x2 is non basic, x3 is non basic. Is that right? And the basic ones, what do you do? Well, you can just solve it. You just take the right hand side, and that's it. Is that right? So x1 will be the right hand side for x1 is there, and x4 is 3 over 8. Okay? So let's write it. So it will be 45, 8, 0, 0, and 3, 8. Is that OK? Now this happened to be, is it feasible or not? It's feasible, isn't it? So how do you see it's feasible before you even write down the, um, this basic solution? If you have the canonical form, how can you see that it will be feasible? What gives away? Where do I get these two solutions from? The right-hand side. You just need to look at the right-hand side of the canonical form, and then you know it's feasible or not, right? All of them have to be positive, right? So this, is, this will be a feasible basic function. OK, so that's uh, one example. So feasible basic, uh, sorry, solution, sorry. Feasible basic solutions are not unique, even the feasible ones. There are several of them. Okay. Now let's take an example two, where I will show the observation number two, that is, um, not all basic solutions are feasible. Let's say um, I choose to pivot. Um, let's say, let's start from 
system double star, and I'm happy with my choice of x4 being pivoted in the second equation, but then I make a choice. I want to pivot um, what will be a choice that caused the trouble. I want to pivot x2 in equation 1. Okay, So this will be the one I will be further pivoting. So in double star, okay, I will do this, pivot x4 in 2, which is already done, and then I will do x2 in 1. So actually the question will be, can I use x2 and x4 as basic variables? Will it give me feasible basic solution? All right, I want to see that. Okay, so I can carry out a similar process. This is already ready, and all I need to do is remove x2 from this equation. So I multiply the first equation by, what should I be multiply with? By negative um, 3 over 5, right? And then add on top of the second one. You can always do that, right? Okay, so you do the work. I skip the detail, and let's see what we get in the end. 8 over 5, x1 plus x2 plus 3x3 equals to 9, negative 3, 5, x1 minus x3 plus x4 equals to negative 3. So let me circle the basic variables that we chose to pivot. So that's a canonical form with x4 and x2 as the basic variables. What will be the basic solution? Will we be able to write it out right away? The basic solution? So what will be x1? That's a non-basic variable, right? It shall be 0. What will be x2? x2 is pivoted here. The right-hand side is 9. Isn't that right? will be x3 is non-basic, 0. What about x4? It's pivoted here. The right-hand side is negative 3. That's the solution, right? The basic solution. Is this solution feasible? Nope, because I get a negative number here. That's not good. So not feasible. Hmm. That's not very pleasant news, isn't it? So in fact, later on in the algorithm, the simplex method, it has to start with a feasible basic solution. And it's actually a pretty big deal to find one because you made the choice of picking some as basic variables, and you carry out your pivoting process. And there's no guarantee that basic solution is feasible. All right? It's quite annoying. OK, so um, let me see what time is it. We have 15 minutes. OK, let's try to um, see, um, have an understanding of uh, what, why this is happening, and how can we design some kind of a um, method or, or algorithm, some technique, at least for this, um, equa for this problem with only two equations, will I be able to see in what situation, if I choose these feasible variables, uh, basic variables, it will give me feasible solution, all right? So um, I will look at a geometric interpretation. In the end, it will give me some kind of an um, algorithm to test if my choice of basic variables are good or not. Okay, So this only works for two equations. Okay. Well, it works also for more, but then I cannot draw a picture. If it's two equations, I can draw in the two-dimensional blackboard. All right? 
So before I get into that, anyone wants to comment? How would you find out if I have a system that's given like this? And let's say, OK, what about I pick x3 and x4? Will that work? How do I figure that out? What, what do I need to see? Any comments? If I pick two of them to be the basic variables, what happened to the non-basic variables? In the basic solution that I'm looking for, the non-basic ones are set to be 0. Is that right? So let's say I picked x3 and x4, and then these will be all 0, right? Then I need to deal with a much smaller um, system, and I need to figure out if I can find non-negative solutions to that one. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's a, a, an important observation. Now, what I will do, we want a geometric interpretation. So I would rewrite, let's go back to the, first, to the original form of my problem, the star. I will rewrite it. Instead of having two equations, I will use vectors. I'll write it as adding up vectors in the following way. So let me write it down. OK. So I will write um, x1. Mm -hmm. And I collect the coefficient of x1 in the two equations. Let's show as a vector. So for the equation 1, I have 1. Equation 2, I have 0 for x1. All right? And then x2 will be 1, 3. x3 will have 2, 1. And then x4 will have 1, 8 equals 2. 6 and 3. Are we comfortable with this form? Do we see? I can write it as adding up all these vectors multiplied by axis shall equal to another vector. Are we OK? We're comfortable? Mm -hmm. I'm going to call these vectors, say, this is v1. And this is v2, and that's v3, and that's v4, and that's vector v. OK? If I write like this, and then I can see the problem from a different angle, and I can state the problem very differently, are we familiar with the term a linear combination of vectors? Have we heard of the term linear combination? You take a bunch of vectors, multiply them each with the corresponding, these are called now coefficients, a scalar number. And then you add them all up and get a new vector. And this new vector is called a linear combination of the other vectors. Have we heard of this term? OK. So now the problem can be stated in a different way. I can say that. I want to find a non-negative linear combination of v1, v2, v3, v4 for the vector b. Is that right? OK. So have a new, new problem. So how do I express um, b? as a non-negative linear combination of all the other variables, v1, v2, v3, and v4. OK? 
But actually, um, our problem is more specific. This is really very general. Our problem, in the end, what I, why, why I did this was I tried to figure out, say, if I pick um, x1 and x2, will this be a good choice for basic variables so that the basic solution is feasible? Is that right? And there, x3 and x4 will be set to be 0. Is that right? So let me reformulate. So my specific question, let's say now, can I use x1, x2 as basic variables? OK? To get feasible um, basic solution. That's underlined. So. So the, and then if I reformulate this question in terms of this vector expression, x3 is 0, x4 is 0, I'll be facing a non-negative linear combination of v1 and v2 to make the vector b. Is that right? OK, so, so new, new question I can re-ask will be find, can I find, OK, actually I should say, can I find a non negative linear combination of only V one and V two to get the vector B. Is that right? So this turns into something um, in geometry. So, OK. So we are interested in non-negative linear combination of two vectors. So let's take a look at, in general, how can we figure that out? What is the strategy? Let's say I, I plot these. So this is x1, x2 in my two-dimensional plane, OK? And I am given two vectors, two random vectors. Uh, OK, two vectors, v1, v2. Like right now, they are randomly given because I just want to demonstrate this idea. So let's say this is vector v1. Mm -hmm. And then I have another vector, v2, OK? The length of this vector doesn't matter in this question. It's the direction they point at that matters. Because I'm doing linear combination. I could multiply v2 by any constant. It's a linear combination of it, right? And I can multiply v, v1 by any constant. And I get a v1. So the question now is, in what region in this graph could I place this b vector so that it's a non-negative linear combination of these two, v1, v2. Mm -hmm. This is the important question. So I want to express b as x1 is a number. It's a coefficient, OK? v1 plus x2. Now, this is not very good. I should not write x here x here, because these x are not these x. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can we say these dimensions are y's? Would that be OK? y1, y2. This is just where I draw my graph, OK? So x2 and uh, v2. Where x1 and x2 are positive. OK. Let's think. If, let's say, um, x2 is 0 further, then I only have x1, which is positive, what would the image of this combination be? I just take v1 and multiply by any positive number. What will I get? I will get along this line any length right along this ray. Is that right? But pointing in the same direction. I cannot point to that direction. Then I'll have to multiply by a negative number. Is that clear? And then if x1 shall be 0, I just have x2 times v2 then all the vectors along this ray would be good, right? Now let's think. I have 
x1 and x2, they are both non-negative. Let's say you know how to add up two vectors. You first take the direction in one, and then you take the other direction, how much you go in the other. That's where you end up with. So where would you end up if they are both positive? So these two rays will form two angles. One is less than 180, the other is bigger than 180. Is that right? See, I take a positive step here, and I take a positive step in the other direction. Which region do I end up with? The region that's this angle less than 180. Is that clear? This is a very important observation. So any vector in this shaded region formed by these two rays, if B is in this region, it can always be expressed as a non-negative linear combination of V1 and V2. Is that clear? That is very important. So if I have a B like this, then this is OK. If my B is outside, then it's not OK. Is that clear? So this will be the region for B to have non-negative um, linear combination. OK, so too many shorthands, but OK. Is that OK? OK, so we don't have time to go through um, more details. So next time, OK, keep this in mind. Next time, we'll use this idea and then to show you that how quickly you can check any combination of x something and x something can be a good choice of your basic variable or not. Okay? Or you can try it by yourself. You know how to do it already.